this Facebook Live event on the issue of intimidation and revisals associated with cooperation with the UN. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us, and um, thanks in particular to Civicus uh, for enabling us to run this event, uh, despite obviously the severe restrictions on uh, side events at the Human Rights Council in association um, with the necessary response to coronavirus. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, I'd first like to start by welcoming a really outstanding panel. Uh, we have uh, Susan, uh, Susan Wilding, who is the head of the Geneva office uh, with the Civicus Alliance uh, and does significant advocacy uh, here at the UN, in particular in relation to uh, the protection of human rights defenders and of civil society space. Uh, to my right, uh, Azadeh Bozan, who's a human rights defender from Iran uh, and a human rights researcher with Impact Iran. Um, immediately behind me, uh, joining me virtually, is Peggy Hicks, uh, the Director of Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures and the Right to Development uh, Division of the Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And finally, uh, Salma el Zosani, who is ISHR's Program Manager, uh, leading our strategy and our advocacy at the Human Rights Council. So um, thank you very much for joining us all today. Uh, today's discussion is a, 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 um, a slight variation on uh, our broad focus on the issue of intimidation and reprisals against those who cooperate with the UN. Um, the aim today is to hone in particularly on the issue of intimidation. The issue of intimidation has been raised uh, multiple times in recent reports of the Secretary General and statements by the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. Uh, who's also designated as the UN senior official on reprisals. Uh, both of those uh, senior officials have raised increased concern about the issue of self-censorship. Um, that is, about the ability of people to engage with the UN being uh, very significantly inhibited due to severe intimidation occurring in often highly restrictive environments. This is a phenomenon which is deeply uh, concerning in and of itself, but of an additional concern are the difficulties that are inherent in monitoring it, uh, in documenting it, and thus in seeking accountability for it. Perversely, we find ourselves in a situation where there are countries that are not cited in the Secretary General's annual report on reprisals, but which may, may be even more closed and more repressive and restrictive than countries that are. And the reason that they're not cited is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, for civil society to engage with the UN at all. Um, in other words, where um, the repressive, repressive tactics, where the intimidation of the state has worked so effectively as to completely eliminate the possibility uh, or inhibit the, the possibility uh, to engage with the UN. So the question we want to uh, address today is how do we course correct? How do we work towards ensuring that an, account an accountability mechanism like the Secretary General's annual report on reprisals presents a more accurate account of which states are actually severely inhibiting and restricting engagement with the UN. The starting point for the discussion today is a new report uh, launched by the International Service for Human Rights. And the report looks specifically at the issue of intimidation. It proposes methodological approaches to strengthen the system's capacity to measure and understand how intimidation tactics, both online and offline, uh, work, and both subtle and blunt work, uh, and um, how to uh, overcome um, the issue of impunity for states' abuses, um, particularly those uh, in highly restrictive and, and repressive environments. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, two questions of, of each panellist. Um, uh, I'll do it in, in two rounds, and um, start with you, Salma. Um, could you walk us through the main findings of the study? and in particular the main recommendations arising from the study. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how we can move beyond naming the problem of self-censorship, which, which the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General have done very effectively, um, and actually move towards finding ways to address it, in particular um, how the mandate of the senior official on reprisals might actually document these situations of intimidation in such a way as to prevent them and to ensure accountability for them. Sure, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. 
So I'll, I'll first start by discussing the, telling you more about the first part of, of, of the report, which discusses the psychological dynamics that influence how intimidation affects those who might need to use UN mechanisms and how people make decisions to take the risks or not. So in looking at the psychology of engagement and how intimidation affects decision making about whether to engage, one of the key findings is that the UN needs to provide a more coherent and informed impact analysis of why engaging with these mechanisms might be worth the trouble and the risks. This is because an understanding of the potential positive impacts of engaging is just as, as important to people's decision making as understanding the dangers. So in this regard, the UN will mandate, but also NGOs and other relevant stakeholders, including states, need to encourage more impact analysis that assesses the positive outcomes resulting from the use of UN mechanisms and to disseminate and popularize any impact analysis, um, impact analysis that already exists. In other words, the system needs to give people on the ground a basis for making judgments about whether to go through the trouble of engaging or not. Now, secondly, Manet can also develop and strengthen new tactics for raising awareness about UN mechanisms and in more closed and repressive countries. So the more repressive the situation is, the less information is available to, to people about the potential of, of UN mechanisms. And then thirdly, we also have to acknowledge the structural inequities that make it more difficult for some victims and activists to access UN mechanisms, and we need to make an extra effort to compensate for them by encouraging their engagement and also by offering protection for, for those who are more isolated or more marginalized. So that's the first uh, part of, uh, of the report. Now, the second one addresses the challenges of developing uh, a data-driven analysis of the impact of intimidation and cooperation in different countries and calling attention to the substantial gaps in available data and suggest some methodological steps forward. In looking at, uh, at data and how to measure abuse, intimidation, and cooperation, the methodology ideas outlined in the report call for more systematic and quantitative management of human rights data. And specifically, the recommendations include, number one, that the UN system should systematically track cooperation, for example, by creating a database, uh, which would then form the basis of regular quantitative reports on cooperation, and which would also track deterioration or improvement from year to year. Secondly, the Office of High Commissioner should continue to improve the level of collection and management of data on all human rights abuses, collaborating with NGOs and uh, academia to enable quantification and comparative ranking of the abuse levels. Now, using these two uh, data sources would then enable the identification of countries where there is high abuse and low cooperation, as well as countries where there is high abuse and high cooperation. And then best practice research could extract lessons from the countries with high level of abuse and high level of cooperation, and that may assist the countries where intimidation has been more successful in sustaining inhibition. So that's to provide an, an, uh, an overview, but there should also be a deeper survey-based research into intimidation and inhibition and, and show and how it is being experienced by citizens and activists in the target countries of concern. So the Office of the High Commissioner and Human Rights NGOs should take advantage of existing data measurement tools on civil liberties and civic space as proxy measurements of the level of intimidation. And this can then help identify countries where a particular study is needed. And just to give an example of the existing data tools that, uh, that are out there, for example, the Civil Post Monitor, Freedom House, Reporters Without Borders, and others. And to, com to conclude on this part, we, I mean, the study and we, we, we recognize the challenges um, of, of, uh, of the methodological challenges in this. And so the study goes into considerable detail uh, on the challenges that are involved in measure measuring cooperation and intimidation. But nevertheless, it makes a strong case that despite these challenges, and quantifying cooperation is really key to identifying in which countries the inhibiting impacts of intimidation are more serious and to effectively be able to track changes over time.
Um, thanks, Salma. So we often talk at the Human Rights Council about the importance of early warning signs and, and early interventions. So I guess that what you're saying is that um, where, um, where sources like the Civics Monitor or the World Reports produced by Amnesty International or, or Human Rights Watch um, tend towards uh, identifying an operating environment as highly restrictive or oppressive, but that notwithstanding, um, we see a, a relatively low level of engagement with the UN human rights system by human rights defenders and independent civil society from that country. We should see that as, a, as an early warning sign um, and really mobilise and act. Right. Um, so I want to turn to you now, Azadeh. Uh, the study uh, that ISHR has produced goes into some detail about the psychological factors um, that uh, are at play in the issue of intimidation, um, inhibition and action. What can you tell us about human rights defenders in Iran and the choices, and I use the term choices advisedly, um, recognising that these choices are made under significant pressure and in highly restricted context, but what are the choices that they're making about engaging or not engaging? Yes, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to ISHR and uh, good afternoon also to the audience that's uh, watching us online. Um, uh, I have to go through a little bit of, just give up an overview of where things are in Iran in order for this to make sense. Um, but I will try to stay focused on the issue of reprisals in doing so. Um, Iran is a case where um, human rights defenders face intimidation, harassment, and reprisals um, of different kinds, both at home and also abroad. Uh, and both online and also offline. So we, we basically have a whole variety of various uh, ways that the Iranian government tries to silence uh, the human rights defenders. I want to also add a couple of things here before I go to the details, is that we're also in a situation in Iran where um, the definition of human rights defender is fast expanding onto the, um, onto the uh, 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 groups and populations in the country that are severely marginalized and um, are also like socioeconomically marginalized um, uh, in addition to the you know the usual uh, uh, politically marginalized groups like you have the ethnic groups or religious minorities and then you know like you have the human rights defenders like journalists and uh, human rights lawyers uh, artists and so on so so we are also facing with this phenomenon that uh, by way of, let's, let's say, for instance, protesting in the streets, you become overnight a human rights defender. Um, and and uh, that has ramifications when we talk about reprisals and harassments, because then you're talking about families, groups of families of victims, who are then the protesters who are left like killed or, or arrested, uh, that are not exposed to uh, the realities of, of being um, human rights defenders or the family of human rights defenders. So there's a level of, um, there's an element of lack of exposure um, uh, that comes with that shock as well, which is, I, I would say, the scale of it is quite unprecedented for us. Um, well, the Iranian government criminalizes cooperation with the UN and, and international NGOs and human rights organizations. Uh, by way of um, uh, essentially for, for civil society organ, uh, organizations and advocates. And he does so by essentially um, connecting, talking to the outside, especially the West, um, uh, a national security kind of a charge. And uh, therefore, you have sort of espionage like charges against human rights defenders. Um, uh, and then um, these kinds of correspondence, uh, and not, it's not just with the UN, with human rights organizations and international organizations, which I think for the case of Iran is important to highlight that exactly because of this um, high level of censorship, uh, uh, the human rights groups and organizations inside and outside do play a role in making that connection happen. So that's why it's also important to talk about the fact that also communicating with human rights groups is, is an issue. And then this, course, this correspondence, uh, whether it's online or it's a meeting, is then used as an evidence to, to essentially create a basis for these highly vague and broad criminal, criminalized cases, which oftentimes get um, imprisoned sentences for over 10 years or more. Um, I just read you a, couple, a few of these charges, gathering and colluding to commit crimes against national security forming a group composed of more than two people, being uh, two people with the purpose of disturbing national security or the membership of such groups, uh, 
or we have spreading propaganda against the system, insulting the supreme leader, insulting Islamic sanctities. As you can imagine, these are very heavy charges. Uh, so that's the one side of things we see. Another side that we see is then when these individuals are, are in prison, um, even when they're very vocal, when they have clearly made the choice that they want to go as far as they can with their peaceful activities to promote human rights in Iran because of lack of access, essentially what happens is that they lose a, a, their agency in order to decide whether or not they should, uh, they want to, um, they want their case to have any kind of international uh, appearance in media or for their families to engage with the UN and so on. So what happens is the burden in then falls on their families. When the burden falls on their families, uh, in many cases, for instance, in the November protests, because of the extreme level of intimidation, or for instance, the Ukrainian flight shutdown, the extreme level of intimidation, and uh, instilling fear in these families. And like I said, the lack of exposure, uh, many of them uh, are very, very, very scared to speak. And when they do, it's uh, often under the condition of an anonymity. And, um, uh, uh, basically what happens is that many of them also then don't at all engage and this brings me to the point that you mentioned Salma is that um, uh, it's they don't in many cases they don't know what's the benefit of, of engaging at all and uh, it's difficult to en to engage in an educational activity when a, a family is going through so much trauma and when you don't have results to show and when other people and when they're let's say the interrogator of their son or the um, the people who have come to them and uh, told them, well, we, you know, your son was killed or your daughter was killed on the street. If you talk, this and this will happen. It's difficult to, at that moment, like also provide counter examples. Uh, and so what happens is that then they remain silent. Um, and uh, uh, in many cases, unfortunately, it's it's too late when they find out that it would have had benefits. Uh, and when they found, find that out, they're not necessarily human rights defenders, these families, so their word doesn't get out to, to others who are in the future get involved. Um, so, you know, we have a number of cases where, um, I, I, won't, I don't want to bore you with it, but uh, the list is quite long of Iranian human rights defenders um, from various fields that are currently in prison because of things like uh, collaborating with UN agencies on environmental rights, for instance, we have Nilo Farabayani, or we have Arash Sadeghi, who is currently diagnosed with cancer, and uh, basically UN, the UN has called it ar his arrest arbitrarily, and, uh, but basically it's because of his human rights activities he's in prison. We have human rights lawyer, Nasser Institute, at some point his, uh, her, her husband was in prison because of the awareness that he was raising. We have Yasaman Aryani who um, objected to mandatory bail, and then her mother, who basically was trying to raise awareness, also in prison. We have Nargis Mohammadi, who is in prison, who, whose case was open because of a meeting she had with an EU former foreign policy chief, uh, Catherine Ashton, on 8th of March of 2014, and we, uh, so on. So, you know, we have many cases like this, but at the same time, our observation as civil society is that when the cases are not talked about, uh, the situation of these uh, uh, prisoners uh, is likely to get worse. Thank you. So turning to you, Peggy, um, the study goes into considerable detail on the challenges involved in measuring cooperation and intimidation. Um, nonetheless, it makes a very strong case that despite these challenges, Quantifying cooperation is key to identifying those countries um, in which the in inhibiting impacts of intimidation are the most serious, are the most serious, um, and to um, track changes in that regard over time. What do you see as the, I guess, potential methodological challenges, um, and also the means that you might overcome them? Thanks very much, Phil. First, let me just start by thanking ISHR for the incredible work on this study. Um, your continued engagement on these issues is incredibly important and useful in terms of advancing the conversation and moving us forward to really take on the challenges that we all face. And, and to emphasize that from the UN Human Rights Office perspective, these issues are absolutely critical, not just from a rights perspective, but of course that's very important, but also from the perspective of, of the UN actually being able to be effective and do the job that it's, that it's tasked with doing. 
that if we do not have an environment that allows for civil society to engage effectively, we will not be effective and will not succeed in our mission as well. So it's, it's, um, it's a, a mutual collaboration that has to be successful for, for both civil society and for the UN to, to do its job. That said, I, you know, I I've, was really interested to hear the report and, and, and look at the issues. I think from our perspective, there are, as you said, both methodological challenges, um, but I think also um, I have some questions about uh, how and, and the framing of how we would take these issues up. Because for me, obviously, we need to sit the issue of cooperation with the UN in a broader framework of cooperation on human rights generally, obviously the UN isn't the only actor in the space. But then beyond that, to me, the issues tend to be quite coextensive with, in general, the space that exists for civil society to work. And so one question I had goes to whether the extent of reporting on cooperation independently of those broader frames will give us a sufficient added value to make it as, as the most useful way to tackle this problem. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do more reporting. I agree there should be more reporting, but I think we need to be quite careful about how big of emphasis we place on, on the data side of um, the cooperation piece. Because to be frank, I think there's already quite a bit of quantitative data and I think there are substantial methodological challenges on the qualitative side. Um, and I think getting, getting the level of qual qualitative data that you need could well be a very time consuming and labor intensive and resource intensive effort that may not give us sufficient added value. And, and I'm not sure if this is the right place to raise this, but I really found the, um, the argument that was being made about how looking at these, these sets of data in a, in a constructive way could be you know, really helpful in terms of evaluating our actions. I found that very persuasive, but I think we could do it with a, a less um, sort of detailed data set. And part of what it made me think of, and I actually did a little graphic, I will try to explain it, but basically the idea is if you put on a graph on one side of it, repression, and on the bottom part, engagement, so that you have four quadrants. You have high repression and high engagement, high repression and low engagement, high engagement and high um, repression. You know, you see my point, right? And what you do in each quadrant differs. So, for example, if we have high engagement and low repression, that's where things are pretty good people are, are civil societies being able to do it. So we don't really have to pay much attention to that. We just do a watching brief on that. When there's low engagement and low repression, well, that's where this issue of, do people really understand how useful this could be? And that's where the education side and the promotion side needs to come in. And then, you know, the more problematic areas are the top two parts of that grid. So looking at where there's high repression and low engagement, those are the ones that are the most difficult, right? Because we know that there, you know, that there is a, a link between those things. And that's where, and I hope that's the next question, we talk about how we increase the cost, how we make it more difficult for states that are doing that. And happy to come to that point. And where there's high impression, repression, and high engagement, that actually sets a different challenge for us. Because those are the situations where we have to put in place additional measures to support civil society that is taking those risks and engaging despite a highly repressive environment. And I do think based on the existing Civicus Monitor and other things, we have enough data already to, to you know, place many situations into this type of graph. And I think working together, we can make real progress on that type of analysis. And I think your report really moves us forward on that, um, on that scale. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peggy. Um, that idea of the four quadrants I, is, is, is really uh, interesting. Um, we, unfortunately, you froze, so we weren't, were unable to see the graphic that, that you showed, but uh, you described it very effectively. 
It does strike me that in a situation where you have um, high repression um, and high engagement, it may also be um, not just about strengthening uh, our response to the issue of reprisals, but also um, strengthening uh, means by which to, um, uh, to, 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 to monitor the engagement of government organised NGOs. Because high repression and high engagement may tend towards um, a, a conclusion that there is a significant, there are a significant number of government organised NGOs engaging. We see a, a lot of Chinese NGOs, for example, engaging with the current session of the Human Rights Council. They're certainly not independent civil society actors and human rights defenders, but rather um, they are um, so-called NGOs organised by the state, propagating the, the state's message. So that's something that we would we would need to control for. Great. No, I'd agree, Phil, and that goes to the issue of the qualitative versus the quantitative data, and you didn't get into that. Uh, good point. Thank you. Sure. Um, so can I turn now to you, Susan? Um, you know, Peggy's talked about uh, the fact that maybe we don't need a whole lot more data, and um, and the study does point to the, the existence um, of uh, human rights analysis such as that undertaken by Civicus through your, your Civicus monitor as being um, very useful, uh, currently available tools uh, and as being potentially uh, valuable proxy measurements for intimidation. So I want to ask you a bit about the Civicus Monitor and in particular how you go about measuring the issue of intimidation within a country and what lessons you might be able to share with us and with the UN in particular, um, where and how it should invest in achieving a, a more um, uh, substantive and quantified understanding of the scale of the problem of, of, of intimidation. Thank you, Phil, and thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, firstly, I think it's important just to explain what Civicus defines intimidation as, and the way we see it is it's any indirect or direct action against anyone to deter them from carrying on their work or to make them fearful of further attack. So I think the importance there is that we see it as a deterrence uh, element. Um, it's, we also see it as a series of measures that may not manifest in physical harm, but has that deterrence uh, effect. For this reason, though, it's incredibly difficult to quantify. We see it as a, a softer restriction, um, but it has alarming implications for civil society. Um, having said that, though, Civicus does draw documentary evidence from activists and human rights defenders on the ground. Um, our activists are asked to measure uh, and report perceptions of intimidation alongside bundling with other intimidation or with other tactics. So, for example, we'll bundle it with restrictions such as harassment, censorship, etc. What we have found through this method and from our, our reports from, on the Civicus Monitor is that, firstly, intimidation does not just take place in restrictive environments. Um, intimidation we see across the board, which means we see it in open governments, open democracies, as much as we do in restrictive um, spaces. The other thing that we see is that it's persistent restriction that has been captured, uh, that it's a rising tactic, rising use, for example, to say. Um, so it's from, in was reported as sort of number seven out of 10 in 2017, to number five in 2019 of the top 10 violations globally. So intimidation may be a, an imperfect metric in terms of measurements, but we view it in a sequence with these others, as I've mentioned already. Um, and in the sequence, we see intimidation as a precursor to more harmful restrictions. So in this light, it should be seen as, um, as a warning or an alert that should we should take very seriously, um, and that if acted upon in a timeless manner could potentially prevent further restriction or further harm to civil society. Thanks very much, Sue. Turning to you again, Selma, um, the study also addresses the politics of intimidation and uh, member state and, and UN responses in that regard. So the question I want to ask you is this, how can NGOs and um, how can states influence the cost-benefit analysis that repressive states are making when they choose repressive actions and targets? Um, and how can we tip the balance towards making 
repressive actions more costly for perpetrators? No, exactly. What uh, also what I was mentioning, how do we increase the, the, the political cost? Well, regarding the, the political aspects of, of intimidation, the study looks exactly at how to hold states that are using these tactics, tactics to deter cooperation with the UN mechanisms to how to hold them accountable. And it's really important to note that this accountability needs to look beyond the high profile, severe attacks and reprisals and the visible actions that these states that these states take in Geneva or, or, or New York based forums. So as a starting point, states need to be call, called out um, to account for their quieter approaches they are using inside the country to sustain this atmosphere of fear and inhibition. So subtle intimidation is so widespread exactly because it tends to attract lesser political costs for repressive states than um, openly or overt um, uh, violence abuses. So that's the first point. Now secondly, states need to also develop and implement stronger policies for uh, domest um, domestic policies and practices for the protection of, of human rights defenders and to investigate threats uh, and attacks against them. Now thirdly, both states and the UN uh, need to apply greater political pressure to states who are violating human rights and who are particularly refusing to allow human rights monitors to access the country and those who seek to uh, block funding and resources to these monitoring mechanisms. And then fourthly, which is also very timely with the Secretary's uh, recent call to action, is that the United Nations Human Rights Upfront Initiative uh, must be effectively implemented by the UN country teams who are witnessing um, in host countries human rights abuses and intimidation. And the fifth thing is that U UN human rights bodies and mechanisms, they should systematically gather evidence of incidents in which citizens were deterred um, in any way from cooperating with them during country visits. And, and, and these include violent incidents, but also the really subtle forms of, of intimidation. And they should publicize these obstacles and, and, uh, and aim to hold states accountable. And then finally, we need to make non-cooperation more politically costly. So for example, uh, campaigning and opposing the election of uncooperative states to the Human Rights Council and to other human rights related bodies. Thank you very much, Salma. Um, so, turning back to you again, as a day, uh, states like Iran, um, of course, deny and will no doubt continue to deny strategies uh, and incidents of intimidation, and that's a really key part of their long-term um, international strategy to disempower and wear down critics. Um, the fact that you're here and the, the great work that uh, Impact Iran undertakes shows that you and other uh, committed activists are not giving up. Um, the question I have is, how do we ensure that states like Iran that are using intimidating tactics to deter cooperation with the UN are thoroughly investigated and held accountable, not just for high profile acts of intimidation and reprisals um, uh, and the visible actions that, that states take in, um, uh, in New York or Geneva based forums like the Human Rights Council or the General Assembly, but um, especially for the quieter approaches that they're using inside the country uh, to sustain an atmosphere of, of fear and of intimidation. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, Peggy's point about the graph that she, she mentioned really made me think um, maybe I can sort of start with that and then uh, characterize it accordingly. But I, when I think about Iran, I think it's a particular case where I would say on average it's a high engagement, high repression when it comes to civil society and the repression on the Iranian side. Um, it's of course the, the gongos that are, um, uh, op, you know, uh, they have a voice at the UN openly, freely, they, can, they don't go back and get arrested <laughs> like the rest of us. Uh, however, it's also the human rights defenders of the country and the, the very many informal networks that they have established throughout the years that does just an incredible job. What is interesting maybe about Iran, and it may apply to other countries of similar nature, is that this high engagement, high repression on the engagement side, I think uh, it has to do with, for instance, like uh, patches of human rights thematic areas of work. Uh, 
I'll give you an example. Like women's rights advocacy in Iran is very, very strong and has a very um, rich history. Uh, and uh, women's rights defenders who are in prison, many of them actually happen to also be human rights defenders. So, so in, in, in a way, like you basically you have high repression when it comes to women's rights related advocacy, but also high engagement because of the, because, because of the uh, exposure throughout the years, the knowledge that has increased throughout the years of what's the benefit of being uh, essentially in, in contact with uh, NGOs and with the UN. Um, uh, but then, unfortunately, what happens is when the repression becomes higher in certain areas, like for instance, more recently environmental rights, more recently labor rights, uh, then it takes time for that engagement to go up because you need education, because you need... So, um, uh, so we, we are faced with a situation like this. Um, I, think, I think in terms of uh, how Impact Iran, which I have to say it's a coalition of NGOs and human rights organizations, so we're very lucky to work with m many organizations uh, who do similar work. Um, uh, you know, we think that, well, okay, so on the Iranian side, uh, and we, we get, for instance, the SR, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights and other thematic special rapporteurs, so the special procedures and other mechanisms would have to continue to make recommendations to Iran and, and continue the pressure on, on, uh, on the basically the question of intimidation and reprisals and characterize it in their reports, what these intimidations are, how are they um, evolving or mm -hmm. are not. Um, but also, as uh, the panelists mentioned, it's, it's about the space for civil society to work. So, so it's about emphasizing on freedom of assembly, freedom of expression. You have a protest in Iran of this scale. Why did the protest have? What, like they, so people don't have other means of, of, of expressing grievances. So I think it's important to, to highlight the interconnectivity of all of this that's happening. Um, and on the uh, other member states on the UN side, I think that um, uh, you know uh, I've noticed, for instance, when the UN welcomes Iran's engagement and cooperation, let's say you know when they talk, when, when we have an interactive dialogue with the SR, on Iran or the UPR, I think exactly at that moment is when you say, well, we are glad that Iran is cooperating to this extent. However, we also have observed that Iran doesn't allow its civil society to cooperate. So, so that they are not kind of um, separated issues. I mean, cooperation is, like, in my opinion, is, is, is a similar issue. The, the state cooperates on, the, on, a, on a similar level maybe in a, more, in a decentralized way, civil society has, ha has to have the right. So if, if the state uh, gets a congratulatory note on cooperation, it has to also get um, you know, a remark about uh, what it's not allowing its civil society to do. Um, I also think that um, um, you know, different member states, EU especially, but I mean, I guess one day, hopefully the world will be at a place where we can also say this for the global south countries, non-Western countries, where they have political dialogues, bilaterals, uh, whether it's on human rights or any kind of bilateral engagements, I think uh, the question of intimidation and reprisals has, they, sh they should bring this up in, in, in uh, whatever way means possible. In terms of the less obvious or explicit ways, I mean, I think that we have different ways, like for instance, communications on the UN side with the state. Uh, those things, of course, require um, uh, you know, the permission of the families uh, of those imprisoned, uh, for instance, or the victims, to, to, for them to basically have some sort of a, uh, uh, a presence in these communications. And that's, of course, very difficult on the families, um, and I think, uh, without imposing that uh, that anybody should cooperate, I think the um, question of education awareness raising, and, and but then not also overwhelming these these individuals and families, and understand that they're going through a, a level of trauma that uh, that needs to be uh, uh, appreciated. Um, so. I think our work is on a, a, a various levels. We as civil society, we have made it our mandate to uh, raise awareness about the benefits, um, while also benefits of engaging with the UN, but also raising awareness about the, the costs of it, and uh, continuing to um, pressure the states, to pressure the uh, Iranian government to uh, reconsider its approach towards human rights defense. Thank you. So um, in seeking to understand how human rights defenders and other civil society actors um, decide to take risks in the course of their work, the study finds that there is 
um, inadequate emphasis and also investment in analysing and communicating the benefits, um, the successes and the potential positive impacts of UN engagement. So I want to turn to you, Peggy, um, and um, you're fluid and moving again now. Uh, <laughs> Um, on, on this issue, we, we are at a, a juncture where um, faith in multilateral institutions seems to be um, declining. Um, we're hearing more and more, uh, and certainly organisations like Civicus and, and ISHR investing more and more uh, in positive narratives uh, within the context of human rights and the human rights defender movement. Um, I guess, d does the finding resonate with you? Do, do, do you agree that we need more information, not more stories about um, the positive impact of, of UN engagement? And um, what is the office doing in this regard? And, and what more could the office do in this regard? Great, thanks, Phil. And, and I really appreciated the, the comments made by all the other panelists, and especially this, this nuance of you know, different sectors having different levels of cooperation, intimidation, reprisal is really important. Um, and obviously we're looking at that in terms of you know, environmental activists who face particularized threats. And you know, that can be said across, as you said, um, different sectors in different places. So that type of analysis is really helpful. Um, going to your question, Phil, look, it, it fits in very well with something that I think the office and all of us in the human rights community have been very aware of overall, which is that the overall narrative on human rights generally, why human rights matter to people in a way that allows us to engage people in support of them um, is not nearly as well told and well developed as it needs to be. And one of the areas, for example, where you see that a lot is around migration, I think. When you look at the, the backlash against migration, even in societies that are fundamentally dependent upon migration for their labor force, you know, you have to realize that something's gone wrong in terms of how we're talking about these issues. So I definitely think there's much more that we can and should be doing. Um, we have been focusing on this. It's part of our strategic plan for this four year cycle was really to look more at some of these issues. And there have been a number of initiatives, I can't outline them all now, but for example, if you go to the special procedures website um, now, there's a whole section on there about good stories there that really looks at some of the success stories behind special procedures mandates and how they've had an impact. And so I do think that that's, you know, that's the type of resource that we can and should develop further. Um, but you know, I have to say, I ultimately, um, I mean, I think there's a broader education effort and I, and I do think that this issue of uh, activists themselves, you know, being able to judge the risks and the benefits um, is, is fundamentally important. And that our job is to really do our best to make that analysis one that allows them to be able to engage. Because as I said, it's to our benefit for them to do so. So from a UN human rights perspective, you know, where we need to invest more of our time, from my perspective, is also in, as has been discussed, raising the cost to states who aren't supporting civil society engagement or who are directly engaging in reprisals or intimidation. And one of the areas we've talked about on that is really making this be something where it's not just on our office, it's on the system as a whole to engage on these issues. And it's not just on you know, the president of the Human Rights Council, it's on every member of the Human Rights Council to see this as their mandate. And how they engage in it can be different. It can be a one-on-one -on -one, you know, meeting with the ambassador of the state concerned. But if the, you know, a Geneva ambassador ends up having a line of ambassadors outside their door who are concerned about intimidation or reprisal, I do think that that can be very effective. And I don't think that happens in the way that it could. So I do think there's much more that can be done to raise costs, as Emma has said. I also think that the other message that we can send is also about how engagement with the UN system can, in some instances, provide um, insulation or support that can help people push back on some of the uh, reprisals or intimidation. 
it is the case sometimes that those that are most connected with external actors who have the ability to raise their cases and to sometimes get greater relief. So that is, a, I think, sometimes a useful argument with local defenders about why engagement works, is that there is a, a you know, a, a potential weight that comes in when you're able to say, you know, this is uh, somebody who has been relied on by a special procedure, or if there is a way to be able to quantify or that they've been cited in a, in a report, you know, that makes them more visible and gives them potentially, um, I think, more immunity sometimes from some of the, um, the negative attacks. But obviously that's a very contextual conversation that has to be left to those who, who understand the risk best. Thanks. Um, well, thanks very much, Peggy. Your, your point around um, the importance and means of increasing uh, cost to perpetrators of, uh, of acts of intimidation and reprisals really um, resonates with me. It's, it's something that we've um, long advocated at, at ISHR. We've, we've spoken to the importance of the Human Rights Council president as the, as the steward of the institution, um, together with the Bureau, um, speaking out publicly on cases of intimidation and reprisals, in, in, including by um, uh, naming states, uh, by with the consent of, of, of victims, uh, citing cases, uh, following up uh, publicly uh, on the, the status and the resolution of cases. Um, we have sought to push states to, to do similarly, um, particularly in the context of the general debate on, on item five and also the discussion, the interactive dialogue on the Secretary General's report on reprisals. And, I've been very pleased to see the, the principled leadership shown by states like Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, um, in actually, uh, in statements, uh, speaking out on individual cases of reprisals and intimidation against, against human rights defenders. But there's also a, a vital role for the, for the High Commissioner uh, in, in this regard. And frankly, we would like to see the High Commissioner speak out more publicly and, and more often uh, on uh, the issue of intimidation and reprisals, including in respect uh, of powerful and repressive states and including in relation to individual human rights defenders. I, I think that that would um, both increase the costs for perpetrators, but also critically to this conversation, it would show um, solidarity with human rights defenders um, in a way which is likely to um, reduce inhibition and, uh, and encourage, encourage cooperation. Um, I've also got a question for you, Peggy, before moving on to a, a question for, 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 for Susan, which has come in via, via Twitter. Um, and uh, the question is this. Um, could it be possible, as a starting point, this is on the question of, of uh, documentation and data sets, could it be possible as a starting point to analyse and document UPR in, engagement over the three cycles? Uh, it seems to be a fairly ready-to-use data set that could reveal something on where cooperation is increasing or decreasing. It won't provide all the answers, far from it, but perhaps it could help us ask some more useful questions. So that's a question that's come in uh, from Madeline via, via Twitter. So I'd invite any thoughts that you might have on that, Peggy. Thanks. Um, I, I actually think it's a, it's a good point, and I, I, I think those of you in the room, including yourself, Phil, probably have um, a, 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 an important perspective on that too. The only thing I'd say is that, for me, one of the key issues on UPR is really what happens at the national level. And that's where that data may not be as clear or, or available, particularly in the places that we're talking about. But I could be wrong on that. And many of you probably have more direct experience on that. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, so turning to you, Sue, um, uh, we've, I've just spoken about um, the role of the president and uh, of the council and, and the high commissioner among others, but um, focusing particularly on states. You work um, a lot with states who are um, committed, um, in reality or rhetorically, to civil society participation. Um, your organisation plays a, a leading role in the negotiation uh, of the resolution on the protection of civil society space and also the resolution on, on human rights defenders. Um, and so this is a question, ha having those kinds of states particularly in mind, um, what role can they play in most effectively addressing the issue of intimidation both at the Human Rights Council and beyond. Great, thanks Phil. Um, I think one of the things that's possibly the sort of across the spectrum of intimidation that we see in the monitor from open to repressed may show is that 
who is doing the intimidation. So sometimes in these open democracies and in the, in the government with the best intentions towards civil society, the intimidation may be coming from non-state actors or from private companies who are threatening environmental defenders to not cooperate or to, to not come forward. And in those situations, I think it's a state's uh, absolute duty, as Selma was saying, to put in domestic policies into place and have strong investigative mechanisms that can stop this kind of non-state intimidation in situations like that. I think in the situations where even the more well-intending states have levels of intimidation, uh, we need to then push it back to the UN system to hold them to account and in doing so, maybe strengthen the anonymity of reports so that uh, human rights defenders feel very safe in coming forward. And whether that happens um, through the country offices or all the way through the, the mechanisms. Then, just practically, in terms of states that want to assist in countries that are oppressed or generally closed. If possible, and it's not always possible, I think as Abed has pointed out, the repercussions of talking even with Western governments, but if some of these well-intentioned governments, they can use their embassies as a safe haven for dialogue and for reporting. And, and what the, we've seen happen before and wh what works well is when embassies start a dialogue uh, platform almost with civil society, um, it just helps them firstly get the information as to what's really happening. Um, and it provides the human rights defenders and activists a space where they feel they can come forward, um, even if they don't feel that they can go through some of the UN systems for various reasons. Um, so that's one thing. But I think overall, if states use intimidation as a bellwether of further abuse, they can act quickly um, and timeously to stop that chilling effect on civil society and to, to protect and promote uh, civic space. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's the state's uh, bear the duty for, uh, for our duty of care for, for their civil society and for their activists. Thank you. Um, we're fast coming to a, to a close, but um, I want to ask each of the panellists um, one more uh, question um, and uh, invite you to give a, a very brief response um, and that is if you could make one recommendation to one actor what would it be who would it be to and um, what would it be just wh while you're thinking on that I mean a, a very simple response that I might give is um, that all relevant actors should rec should implement all relevant recommendations from uh, from this uh, important report um, but uh, if I was to think more specifically, I, I, I would tend towards a recommendation that um, the Secretary General uh, present his annual report on intimidation and reprisals to the General Assembly uh, in such a way as to bring more vis visibility to cases uh, and to raise the political cost for, for perpetrators. It's in fact a, a course that's been recommended um, in a, an important report on prevention uh, which has been uh, tabled and discussed at the current session of, of the Human Rights Council, and it's, that's a, a recommendation we would we would strongly endorse. Um, but maybe Salma, I'll, I'll start with you. One recommendation to one actor. So the recommendation is for the Office of the High Commissioner, and it would be to include in the summary report that they do for the UPR a specific table uh, about uh, whether the state was cited in the reprisals report, and then for the High Commissioner when she's sending the follow-up letters to the government to cite specifically uh, cases of reprisals when individuals give their consent. Thank you. Very concrete, Selma. Um, Peggy, next in line. The Secretary General's recent call to action is incredibly timely and critical here. And within it, there is a process about engaging the full UN system and giving guidance on how the rest of the UN system can see these issues as part of their mandate. So how do we get the rest of the system to understand how they can respond to reprisals, to intimidation, how they can engage in protection for civil society? And obviously different organizations have different roles, different tools, 
but really advancing that conversation is a critical part of how, how to move this forward. So we're really looking forward to continuing to work on that piece. And we've just done consultations with civil society on those issues, which I hope everyone listening participated in one way or another and hope to really pick up on the great uh, input we got there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn to you, Hesedate. Sure. Um, well, I guess mine would be um, for any UN mechanism that's uh, uh, essentially doing reporting on the human rights situation in Iran, which I think they all know, but as a reminder, uh, is that uh, I understand the need for objectivity and corroborating facts and data that comes from in country, but sometimes uh, the multiple layers of, of, of checking and rechecking and verifications of, of the data where you know people are look, essentially risking their lives to provide. Mm -hmm. Our coalition members go through many, many different creative ways to get this information. Sometimes this um, do no harm policy, while it's absolutely important and um, necessary and critical, can, can actually get to a point, and, and, and the need for, again, verification of objectivity can get to a point that by itself becomes a risk. And, and that, to me, means um, uh, somehow reconsidering and rethinking uh, the UN's engagement with civil society and human rights organizations in situations like Iran, where many of them are essentially acting as intermediaries outside the country. So maybe objectivity in some cases means like talking to multiple actors who are outside uh, and somehow comparing that information, but not putting the burden on the family to get multiple times uh, mm -hmm. uh, verifications. So that's Thank you. Susan. Last one. Um, mine would be to states, um, to say don't ignore reports of intimidation, don't see it as an isolated event, um, but rather see it as uh, part and parcel of uh, accumulative restrictions on civil society that will eventually lead to a more restrictive environment. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, can I um, close the event, first of all, by um, thanking our excellent speakers. Um, so thank you, Salma. Thank you, Azadeh. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you, Sue. Um, I also want to uh, um, pay particular tribute to um, Leah Mahoney, who was the um, consultant engaged by ISHR to assist with the preparation uh, of this report, uh, together with Madeline Sinclair, our New York uh, office co-director, uh, who leads ISHR's work on reprisals um, and was really the conceptual and strategic brain uh, behind this report and behind uh, much of our work in relation to intimidation uh, and reprisals. Um, the report will be published on the ISHR website uh, imminently. Um, thanks also to um, Civicus and, and your team uh, for hosting the Facebook Live and to the ISHR communications team um, for the very informative um, Twitter feed. Uh, and finally, to those of you online um, who've joined us, um, thank you very much for, for doing so, and I would invite you to continue the discussion um, via Twitter using the, the hashtag uh, endreprisals. Um, thanks very much, and have a good rest of the day.